taking a more in-depth look at polynomial functions. So right now we are going to be graphing them. You have saw the introductory video on graphing polynomial functions, and the previous lesson, in fact, was factoring polynomial functions. Typically, where we start graphing polynomial functions, they will also already be in factored form. But here are some examples of polynomial functions. The first polynomial function of degree 0 is y is equal to 3. We call this a constant function. The first degree, or a degree 1 polynomial function, is a linear. The reason why it's degree 1 is the highest exponent for a variable is 1, linear. You're quite familiar with linear. A second degree polynomial is a quadratic. Third degree polynomial function is cubic. The fourth degree polynomial function is quartic. The fifth degree is quintic. So really, each of these, the degree, it matches up with the highest exponent seen in the equation. So very quickly, a polynomial function is a function that can be written in this form. Um, here, very, very important attributes of a polynomial function are a n and n. So a n or a's are the coefficient of each term. So we are quite familiar with the word coefficient. a n is the leading coefficient. Now a n is the number in front of the term with the highest exponent. So this is known as the leading coefficient. Really important to pick it out when graphing a polynomial function. The largest exponent is known as n, and this is the degree of the function. Degree of the function is really important in determining shape. So, for example, uh, one, when we take a look here, I'm just going to pick out some, some items that I know. The degree of the polynomial is the highest degree, so it's 4. The leading coefficient is negative 1. Now, here's a, here's a freebie for us. The y-intercept is just 12. So in that earlier notation, a naught, the one at the very end, we can say is the y-intercept. Now, the y-intercept is really not that important to us, but it's free information. So example two. What we see is the highest exponent is 5, so the degree of the equation is 5. The leading coefficient is 7. Again, we have some free information where the y-intercept is negative 3. Example 3. This one looks a little bit different, yet it is the same. So what is the degree? You have to ask yourself, if I multiplied all of these terms out, what would be the exponent on top of x? So x times x times x times x times x. There's five x's. So it'll be x to the power of 5. Now the leading coefficient, 1x times 1x times 1x times 1x times 2, if you multiplied all of those terms out, it would simply be 2. Now actually 2 is not that important. What we'll see later is that whether the number in front of the um, x to the power of n is positive or negative. So really, what we're looking for is a leading coefficient that's positive or negative. All right, if you want, now here it's much, much more difficult to see the y-intercept, but you could calculate it by simply plugging in x is equal to 0 and calculating. So some things about a polynomial function. I'm hoping that you have some notion of what a polynomial function is. It's a weird curvy graph, essentially, in many instances. But a polynomial function is a continuous, or is continuous, and that means without break. Generally, you can graph it without picking up your pencil. 
there are several factors that determine the shape of the graph. Number one, the degree of the equation. Two, the leading coefficient. Three, the type of zeros, and sometimes we call this the mul multiplicity of zeros, and the location where those zeros are. And this is more of a curiosity sake for now. We are going to graph uh, polynomial functions, and what we'll see is that it has a maximum of n minus 1 turning points. Uh, a turning point on a parabola, for instance, was the vertex. It is the point in which the function turns from going downhill to uphill, or from decreasing to increasing, or from increasing to decreasing. All right, let's take more, uh, let's jump into this then. And really, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at an assortment of facts, and then we're going to put everything all together, and I'm hoping that it almost resembles an art project for you. Just have to follow some guidelines. So I am going to say you are already the master of two very important polynomial functions. You are the master of a linear function and a quadratic function. So we're going to create um, not quite an analogy, but we're going to build off what we know. When the degree of the equation is odd, the left hand and right hand side of the behavior mimic those of a linear function. And what I mean by left hand and right hand side behavior, if my pencil is a graph, really we'll probably have a whole bunch of turning points. Maybe I'll get a piece of paper here. So if I start my graph here, and it has a whole bunch of turns, my left-hand side behavior and my right-hand side behavior, what does my function do on the left-hand side and what does it do on the right-hand side? For instance, the, what I've drawn now is an odd degree function. And we'll figure out why maybe a little bit later, but what I know is on the left-hand side, this function is going up and as it leaves on the right-hand side, it's going up. So our function's increasing on the left-hand and right-hand side. But let me get back to this. If the degree of is odd, the left-hand and right-hand side behavior mimic those of a linear function. So here, I'm just going to write y is equal to mx plus b. If my slope is positive, it goes that way my slope is negative, it goes that way. Now, when I say slope, that's really the leading coefficient. Now, here I'm going to write the quadratic in just a slightly different form. My quadratic. When my leading coefficient in front is positive, it opens upwards. When my leading coefficient is negative, it opens downward. We'll talk to a little bit more at that uh, very, very soon, probably immediately. So here we are, odd degree uh, function. So an odd degree uh, polynomial function with a positive leading coefficient. Now, the end behavior is going to mimic that of a linear function with a positive slope. So now, this could be a whole bunch of curves in the middle, but on the left-hand side, it looks like this. On the right-hand side, it looks like this. In other words, it resembles a linear function with a positive slope. If the leading coefficient is negative, simply, it, on the left-hand side and right-hand side, the function has an overall negative slope. And actually, the correct terminology is the function is decreasing. Now, let's talk about even degrees. You are the master of even degrees. So quadratic, when the positive, when there's a positive leading coefficient, we notice that the parabola always opens up. When there's an even coefficient, the parabola, sorry, even, co even degree, negative 
leading coefficient, that the parabola opens down when the leading coefficient is negative. That's all there is to left hand and right hand side behavior. If we remember these facts, and, and they should be somewhat familiar with to you, then you should be put one large piece in the puzzle here. The type of zeros we're going to talk about. Now, we've really not talked about the type of zeros, but we have seen zeros a lot. Different types of x-intersects. Sex. So, here, the type of zeros, um, we're going to consider three different types. A single zero, a triple zero, and a double zero. Hopefully you don't follow that order. We're going to consider a single zero. What do single zeros look like for an x-intercept? Normally, the graph just simply goes right through the x-intercept. Zoom right through. Right through. The important part is we have to know where, where is that zero located, or where is that x-intercept located. So this, a single zero, we say it has a multiplicity one. Hoping this makes sense. Probably right now you're asking yourself, well, is there another type of zero? And I'm going to say, absolutely. There is a, dun, 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 a double zero. Now, a double zero is really interesting because we have our turning point right on the x-axis. And you've actually seen this before. In quadratics, for instance, y is equal to x plus 2 squared. Well, that it has the vertex on the x-axis, and it occurs at negative 2. We've seen this before. So that was actually a double zero. So double zero, if you are above the x-axis, it comes down, hits the x-axis, and bounces up. So it doesn't go through the x-axis. So, However, if you're below the x-axis, you hit the x-axis at your double zero, and you go back down. All right. I said we're going to talk about a triple zero. This is what my triple zero is. My triple zero has elements of a single zero. That is, it burns, it goes right through the x-axis. However, it flattens out within one unit. So it needs to, you really need to draw it with a flattened out shape. So for instance, if it crossed the x-axis at three, your graph should really flatten out between the units of two and four. On the other hand, so if it's above the x-axis and you know there's a triple zero, you have to go through, but it has to flatten out. On the other hand, if you're below the x-axis and you're, you know that this is a triple zero right here, you're going to go through it, flatten out, and go up. All right, I'm not going to bore you too much with the details here. So there is a lot going on here. I'm going to encourage you to read this, press pause, read this, and unpause, and we'll come back. Good. I'm glad you unpaused and took a break and really read that through. There's some interesting things that we're going to do. We're actually not even going to label the y-axis. If you fooled around with this in Desmos, you probably realize that the y-axis or the y values get really, really, really high. Another thing that we're going to do is whenever you're in trouble, you don't know what's going on, just take an x value, plug it into the equation, get a y value. Really super important. Um, so, like I said before, the location and the type of zeros are important, the leading coefficient, the left-hand and right-hand side behavior. We're going to put it all together and graph it. So I'm going to start off, sorry, on my next page, and identify the maximum number of turning points. Not really that important. However, 
This is degree 4. The maximum number of turning points, remember, is n minus 1. So f here, this function, has a maximum number of 3 turning points. A cubic function has a degree 2, so it has, sorry, degree 3, so it has a maximum number of 2 turning points. This is quite a crazy function. This is degree 5, so it's going to have a maximum of 4 turning points, one less than the degree. This is a line. How many turning points does a line have? Well, the degree here is 1, so it has 0 turning points. You probably know that already. All right, this is new information, what we're going on to, and this, these two are going to be more critical here. For example, I'm going to identify the left-hand and right-hand side behavior for some of these. I believe I'm going to be doing this one, and I'm going to be doing this one. So the left-hand and right-hand side behavior, two things that are important for it. Number one is we know, need to know the degree. What we see is that the degree is even. The leading coefficient in front of the x is 1. So it's an even degree, a positive leading coefficient, and I have to think that I'm an expert in even degree functions. Which one? Quadratics. So it's going to be an even degree, so it means that it's going to open upwards because there's a positive leading coefficient. Hopefully that makes sense. What's going to happen in the middle? Not too sure. Now here, this is an odd degree function. My leading coefficient is negative. So am I the master of an odd degree function? Absolutely. A line. When the leading coefficient is negative, it implies that there's an overall negative slope to the graph. What happens in the middle? Probably a bunch of turns. Good. We got this. Next, identify the type of zeros for the following functions. So the type of zeros, and we call them multiplicity. So there are several types. There's going to be a single, a double, and a triple. Now, I don't know if this function is going to have one of each, but it really comes, where do we get this, these words? It really comes from the exponents above the factors. For example, if we have a factor of x minus 1, what is my x-intercept? Now, recall that we let y is equal to 0. When we have a factor of x minus 1, and we saw this with the factor theorem, we have a single 0 at 1. And the reason why is we have to equate this factor to 0. A double 0. A double 0, when do we observe those? When the exponent is 2. When do we have a double 0? Well, when this factor is equal to 0. When is this factor equal to 0? when x is equal to 0. A triple 0. A triple 0, well, here we have one because the exponent is 3. Now, when is this factor equal to 0? This factor is equal to 0 at negative 2. Let's move on. Next example. We're going to identify the types of zeros. Now here, what we may choose to do or may not do is we may look to the exponents. Now what I see in the exponents, there is exponent 2, exponent 2. So why do we call it a double zero? Simply because if you were to expand it, you would have a double factor of x plus Three. Now that often makes sense, right? So we'll get a double zero there and a double zero there. So when are these 
we want is x plus 3 equal to 0 when x is negative 3. When do we have, so we have another double zero here. When is, when is x minus 2 equal to 0? When x is 2. So we will have two double zeros. So I think I'm going to stop there. Maybe take some time to look over what we've done. It won't really cement in a 